Hey everyone! So this video is about just the fundamental aspects of motivation and emotion. Um, I'm just going to talk about the theories behind motivation and the theories behind emotion and the rest of the content in this unit is going to come from you guys. So a big question that motivation seeks to answer is what kind of forces play a part in these changes um, that psychologists would label motivation? What drives you to behave the way that you behave? And then in addition, how do emotions play a role in this drive? Let's start with a real fundamental definition of motivation. There's plenty of them, and I know you've used this term often, but we're going to define motivation as feelings or ideas that cause us to act towards a goal. Now, some motivations are very, very obvious, but others are quite subtle. So this chapter in your textbook is about three major motivations in our lives, food, sex, and achievement. Um, and before we get into that, let's talk about the basic motivational theories. So instinct theory. This comes from Darwin. Um, this theory is that we are motivated by our inborn automated behaviors. So instinct theory says that motivation is something that's unlearned. It's passed down from generation to generation. So think about salmon. Every year they travel hundreds of miles upstream. They lay down some eggs and sperm and then they die. Now their dead carcasses help feed their young when they hatch. Um, think about the salmon. Did they learn this complex set of behaviors? Um, did they say, hey, I'm bored, let me go uh, swim upstream? No, of course not. This was purely instinctual. They're unlearned. A human example would be the baby's inborn um, reflex to eat. And um, this is a, a fine theory, it's helpful, but it only explains why we do a small fraction of our behaviors. There's more to what we do. So next we have the drive reduction theory. So this is the idea that we are driven by basic biological needs, so food, water, shelter, etc. And these needs are to seek homeostasis. This is the concept of balance in our bodies. So our bodies are always driven to maintain homeostasis and what we desire we will um, pursue to meet homeostasis. So we have primary drives versus secondary drives. A primary drive is a biological need like hunger, going to the bathroom. A secondary drive is a learned need like money. Again, a good theory, but it doesn't tell us everything. It cannot explain all of our motivations. Sometimes we're motivated to perform behaviors that don't seem to fit with any need or drive, whether it's primary or secondary. What about people who do these kinds of things, like skydiving? What motivates them? What drives them to do this kind of thing? Neither of these theories really explains it. So next we have the arousal theory. This theory states that we are motivated to seek an optimal level of arousal. So the question is, what is the optimum level of arousal? Well, it depends on the individual. People with high optimum levels of arousal will be drawn to high excitement behaviors like bungee jumping. Well, the rest of us are generally satisfied with less exciting or less risky kind of things. Um, now, there's a Yerkes-Dodson law that comes into play here. What this law says is, in general, we perform better um, at moderate levels of arousal. It's pretty basic, if you think about it. Um, now, considering this graph and this law, um, think about, like, it, if you do an easy task, you can perform an easy task quite well with a high level of arousal, but with that same high level of arousal, um, you might not do very well at a very difficult task. So this whole concept of, is about balance and what a moderate level of arousal is this balance that we obtain um, and we perform best at that level. Um, think about getting ready for your ACTs or getting ready for some kind of um, stressful event. If you're very, if you're pumped up and you're excited, your sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in and it's very hard to concentrate. But if you're not aroused at all, if there's nothing going on, you just won't put anything into it and you're still not going to perform well. So this law basically states that there's this middle or moderate level and in which we all perform our best. Finally, when we're examining motivation, we also have to consider incentives. 
Sometimes behavior is not pushed by a need, it is pulled by a desire. So incentives are stimuli that we are drawn to due to learning. Where our needs push, incentives pull us in reducing our drives. So consider a person who's been food deprived. If they smell baking bread, that's the incentive. They feel a very strong hunger drive. This theory works well when you examine your own personal motivation. Uh, we learn to associate some stimuli with rewards and others with punishment, and we're motivated to seek the rewards. So for example, you may um, have chosen to study with friends before, and you may have learned that it's fun, but sometimes it doesn't produce the desired results around test time. So you're motivated to study alone to get the reward of a good test score. Maslow comes into play again. You should remember him from the section on personality and um, learning about the humanistic approach. So Maslow came up with a hierarchy of needs. He suggested that certain needs have priority over others. Here is that hierarchy again. So when we examine this hierarchy in terms of motivation, this can predict which needs we will be motivated by to satisfy first. So he predicted that we will act to satisfy our basic biological needs first, like food and water, and then we would work our way up the pyramid, depending on which level we're at. So next we have emotions. We have theories of emotion. Now, emotion is at the heart of who we are as people. When we consider how are we different from machines, many of us talk about personality and emotion. This is a reflection of our mental state. For those of you taking the AP exam, you have to be aware of these three different theories that try to explain how and why we have emotions. So let's start with the James Lang theory. This theory is that we feel emotion because of biological changes caused by stress. So, ah, you feel something scares you, your heart begins to race, and that bodily change causes you to feel, feel the fear. Uh, maybe your knees are shaking like that monkey. So the key distinction with the James Lang theory is that your feeling of fear or your feeling of emotion followed your body's response. So first comes the distinct physiological response. Then, as we observe that response, comes our experienced emotion. This, in many ways, you might think is like backwards or counterintuitive. It's against um, what many of us would think when we think of how we experience emotion. Next, we have the Cannon-Bard theory. Walter Cannon and Philip Bard said, no, that's, that theory doesn't work. The question here is that elevated heart rate, that elevated level of stress, elicits different emotions. How can that be true? So this theory states that the physiological change and the cogn cognitive awareness of that emotion occurs at the same time, simultaneously. Now remember the thalamus, that's the switchboard to the brain. Um, this theory believe that the thalamus sends information from the environment simultaneously to the autonomic nervous system for the body changes and to the cerebral cortex for that emotional state. Now this theory isn't bad either, however, um, Cannon really overestimated the role of the thalamus and underestimated the other brain structures like the amygdala in the formation of emotion. And finally we have the two-factor theory of emotion. So Schachter takes the canon Bard theory that they happen at the same time. However, this theory allows us greater understanding to perceive the differences between emotions, between strong emotions and weaker emotions. So the idea behind this theory is that you first experience physiological arousal, so the biology, and then you find a label in your mind, cognition, to explain the emotion. So for example, you're feeling unwell, you may deduce the illness from the symptoms. This theory explains that your biological state will interpret emotions differently. So if I go for a jog and you are laying in bed, my heart rate is more elevated. Now if somebody jumps out and scares us, 
we're going to experience this emotion differently. I will experience greater fear because my heart rate is already elevated. And what, when I interpret what my body is feeling, it will feel like a worse fear. The same explains feelings of love. If you want to experience more passionate feelings, tell your boyfriend or girlfriend how you feel just after you've worked out. Because you already have an accelerated heart rate, the feelings are more intense. So biology and cognition interact with each other to increase the experience. So here's another slide showing that two-factor theory. And that is all for theories of emotion. See you guys on Thursday.